you know, I wrote some and then I would get off and I'd ride some. And then as, as you're doing this, you have like two miles or whatever. And it just seems like it's never ending. Like, I don't know how many hours it took me to get to the top, but we get to the top. And then, and then, and then you have these, these people descending right beside you. And it's, it's just rocks and crevices everywhere. And I, there was a point that I, I looked up and I saw all these riders and I'm like, oh my gosh, I still have like all this distance to, to get up. And then you have these riders bombing down beside you and it looks really technical. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to do this? And I almost just like freaked out. And I just had to like mentally talk to myself. I'm like, I can do this, you know, like just one step at a time. But, and then you're wheezy because you can't breathe because you're up at like 13,000 feet. <laughs> Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We're here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hey everyone, hot off the presses, or I guess hot off the mountains of Colorado, we bring you a Leadville 100 race recap. We recorded this podcast just this morning because here at I Race Like a Girl, we make sure to bring you the news you need to know when it happens. But also selfishly, I wanted to hear all about this race. So I said, we have to record it right away and get it out to everybody. So here we are. Uh, We have a special guest on this podcast and who is in Colorado right now and just raced Leadville. And that is my husband, Seamus. So he is joining Angela um, with this race recap, if you don't know about Leadville, Leadville is one of the toughest mountain bike races on the circuit. Um, it's a bucket list race. Athletes race at elevation. They go up to almost 13,000 feet and it's long. It's 104 miles. The climbing and descending is challenging as well. Um, and you will hear all about that in this podcast. And what I love too about this conversation is, is that Angela comes in with not a lot of mountain bike experience while Seamus comes in with a lot of mountain bike experience. So it's fun to hear the different perspectives on that and how they approach the race and how they did. Um, So you'll be hearing all about that. And, you know, as usual, there's lots of advice in here and lots of laughs. And as Angela says, (laughs) it was a day. So we will have a quick word from our sponsor, The Feed, and then have a listen. Hey, everyone. We are excited to have a new sponsor for the podcast. This episode is sponsored by TheFeed.com. The Feed is the largest online marketplace for your sports nutrition, and uh, both Angela and I use it. So, Angela, what do you love the most about The Feed? Well, the best part of the feed is you can sample all different types of products and gear. And if you enjoy it, you can get a whole packet um, of gels, say of like 20, if you really like it for really, really cheap comparatively. Or if you want to try different products, you can just get one offs. Um, It's just a fantastic way to trial and error. Mm -hmm. Basically everything that you want for for your nutrition. I really like, I feel like it's, curated for athletes so they pick and choose what they want to put an offer on their site and they have really amazing products and I do like that you can just buy one gel and see if you like it and then buy more and we are so lucky to offer you guys a discount code 25% off almost all feed products using the code race girl that's the feed.com Use the code race girl and go check it out because we use it. I mean, we get packages. I get packages almost every week from the feed. (laughs) We go a little overboard, but there's so much on there. It's not just nutrition. There's um, massagers. There's hyper ice products. There's, um, I mean, clothing and gear, a variety of different clothing and gear. I actually just tried a couple bars that I've never even heard of before. And they're fantastic because myself I'm not much of a cook so I like to have things on the go and throw a bunch of fuel in my car so that anytime I I need a snack I always have healthy snacks and you know the bars are fantastic if you can get some good ones so it's really opened up my eyes to a variety 
yeah, it's just a one-stop shop for athletes. Mm -hmm. So once again, 25% off almost all feed products by using the code RACEGIRL at thefeed.com. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. Um, Angela and I are here, but Angela is in Colorado, and I am here on Cape Cod, and it is the morning after the Leadville 100 Mountain Bike Race, and we have a special guest also with us. Um, who is sitting with Angela at the Airbnb, and that is my husband, Seamus, who also completed the Leadville 100. So welcome both of you from far away. It is very early there. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing okay, Seamus. <laughs> I'm doing okay. Rough night sleep last night. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually felt pretty amazingly good this morning. Little headache. Yeah. Like, well, so do you think you both had a rough night's sleep because you raced? Like I always have a rough night's sleep after a big race because I'm so amped up. Or do you think it's because of the altitude? It's definitely a combination. I mean, you're at altitude. We're at 10,000 feet right now. We come from zero. <laughs> um, so that's going to cause a lot of issues. Um, I've had to take Tylenol and aspirin just to kind of get rid of the headaches, um, but just tons of hydration and um I mean, obviously we raced yesterday, so you add all that to it. <laughs> the, I'm on my third cup of coffee and that's the third cup of coffee is taking the headache away. Um, yes. I haven't had any, I haven't had any at time in the last one, but um, I think it's for me, I think it's mostly just post post race tossing and turning. And, and uh, I think my body is like pumping out heat, like a, mm. like a toaster. Um, can't sleep when, I'm, when it's like that. So, yeah. So let's actually, for anybody who doesn't know, let's just talk about this Leadville 100 uh, mountain bike race. And I know there's a series. So can you just tell us um, about this race? Um, I know this is race number. Is this race number four in the Lifetime Grand Prix? It is. Yeah. So yeah. in the Lifetime Grand Prix, there was an opportunity for 30 men and 30 women to apply. Um, and so I applied and. There's three mountain bike races, which, I mean, I should not be in, but I am. <laughs> um, and then three gravel events. And so Leadville 100, I saw it a few years back, and it was always on my bucket list. always wanted to do it. So I was really excited that I could jump into it. Um, so it's the fourth of the series. It's 100 miles. I don't know how much we climbed. How many? How many we climbed? 11,000. Over, just over 11,000 feet of climbing. I just have to put it out before we even start. That was the hardest <laughs> hardest thing I have ever done. <laughs> there was a point, Amy, I literally was climbing Columbine and I was just going to start bawling. And I, I, I like had to stop myself because I knew if I'd started, it would, like, I wouldn't have gone down because people were bombing down this hill. And I was like, there's no way in freaking hell that I'm going to be able to do that. But in the end it was fine. No, we, we can go over it, but I can't, God, well, I can't so wait hard. to hear that. No. Put this in perspective. How many full distance Ironman have you done? I've done quite a bit, like 11 or 12, maybe. And this is the hardest. This reason. is the, this was, this was mentally way out of my element and extremely hard. Like, oh, <laughs> I finished that line oh and I didn't even know what god. to god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's crazy, because you, you have done some wild stuff. Like, you did the 200 miler Unbound this year. Yeah. You did, like, you've done some crazy stuff this year. Now, the Lendo 100, I mean, this race is a bucket lift a bucket list race for many people it like everybody knows about this race if you're in the mountain bike scene and i know Seamus this has been on your bucket list also for a while and tell us i think you raced for a charity right yeah i i did a, a fundraiser for challenged athlete foundation which does um they give out grants for um athletes that are that need adaptive equipment for to compete in sports, uh, like if they've lost a limb or um, or need any other type of adaptive equipment so that they can compete and race. Um, and the this year for just this race, I think there was seven athletes that raced under with for Challenge Athletes Foundation and maybe maybe more. Um, but together we raised uh, right just about a hundred thousand oh, wow. dollars, um, which is going to be give out at least thirty grants um, to adaptive sports. 
Um, so it's pretty exciting. And it's the, we've got a bunch of people right on Cape that, um, that have worked with them and really, really speak highly of them. And yeah. And when we, Angela and I talked to Bob Babbitt, that's, I mean, that's Bob Babbitt's foundation. So, um, you can go back and listen to that podcast also and learn about that. (laughs) Um, so well, congratulations. I'm glad that you went out there. So let's just quickly talk about, um, the buildup to the Leadville 100, because it was a little rocky for both of you, just like me. We, um, you had COVID a couple weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. and so that always puts a damper on training. Um, and uh, but you both recovered. But how do you train for a hundred mile mountain bike race that has like eleven thousand feet of climbing, which is basically a thousand feet every ten miles, which was kind of like rooted Vermont. Um, and so, like, how do you how did you build for that? Well, I coach Seamus, but Seamus is a mountain biker and he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> so in terms of the mountain biking, it's not something of my forte, but in terms of the, of the engine, I can, I, I can coach yeah. that. Um, so yeah. for me, I can just, I'll, I'll talk quickly about me. Yeah. So yeah, I did like Placid and then a couple of days later I got COVID and that was really crappy. Um, so, yeah. uh, you, we just had to kind of go through that. And then I met you guys and then you guys got COVID. <laughs> so we just kind of passed it around. <laughs> she gave um, us COVID. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for yeah. that, yeah. by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, but we, but we, can, we can thank our good friend who gave it to us. <laughs> um, but for me, I mean, we obviously live on the Cape. So there's no like crazy mountains yeah. or anything. So it's really about building the aerobic engine and skills for me. Um, I would go out to Plymouth sometimes. And so my friend, Brian Hughes, his kind of helps coach me. He builds my bikes. He does a ton of stuff for me. He taught me a little bit, um, but I kind of just winged it. I mean, there was nothing else I could do, but wing it. Basically we flew in quite late. So the best way to, to race at altitude is either go in really, really early, like a month early or within 48 hours. And so we try to fly in all of us. We flew in quite late. And it works fantastic. Um, I mean, I had a great race in terms of that. I know Seamus had a phenomenal race. Um, and you don't really feel the effects um, of altitude until like day three, four, five. So we're going to go swim later today and we'll probably feel it a little bit. Um, but the actual mm-hmm. race was fine. But for me, for training wise, it was it was just see what would happen. I mean, I, I this was way out of my element. But but Seamus <laughs> did um, yeah. maybe talk about your trends pyrenees race and stuff but he's a mountain biker so he's like in his element like we've got two opposites here which is good because we have somebody who was out of their element in terms of like the mountain biking and then Seamus uh was in his element so talk a little bit Seamus about your build to this well I had a lot of I had a some really good uh mountain bike races to build in and and uh rooted Vermont gravel race the week before Two weeks before, two weeks before, um, I had done Trans Pyrenees, which is a seven-day mountain bike stage race uh, across the Pyrenees from the Atlantic coast of Spain to the Mediterranean coast of Spain, which ends up being like six hundred miles over seven days and sixty something thousand feet of climbing. So about, so I'm basically doing like a Leadville elevation wise every day. Um, so I had a lot of, I had a lot of, uh, climbing experience and a lot of endurance experience, but, um, I was telling Angela yesterday that this, like, I've been working with coaches mostly for mountain bike training, uh, for the last six years. This is my first year working with Angela and I think, um, I think this is my strongest year so far. And especially for these, like, really long distance ones, I think the triathlon training really helps with these ultra distance events because you can just, if you're just bike training, um, there's only so much, so much your legs can take. Whereas when you're doing all three sports, your total training volume can go up and, you know, it's not, it's not all you know, mountain bike specific, but it's, uh, getting that 
it's all hitting that aerobic engine. Like yesterday's race, I felt I was basically strong start to finish. Um, there was some there was some dark moments in there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get but, to um, it. Yeah, but I, I had I you know I was right up to the finish line. I was I was putting out good watts and um, and I think that has a lot to do with the triathlon training that I've been doing too. Multi-sport training for the win. And also, I think it also has to do with that you have a really good coach, obviously, who plans your programming like <laughs> perfectly. So yeah. shout out to Angela Nate coaching. <laughs> Seamus um, is actually, let me just put a caveat out there. He's he's probably one of the most fun athletes I've I've coached because he's got so much talent. And I mean it's not me. It's him. It's all him. <laughs> so I think quite honestly, if you gave him anything, he would do well, but maybe if there's just a little bit of coordination, he's doing really well. Um, but it's been super fun because most of my athletes are triathletes. And so I've never had someone yeah. who's like, you know, he's going to trans Pyrenees. He's doing, you know, like a race next weekend that I have to figure out now. And, and it's just like, it's constant change and, and, and variety and so and I want him to do really well because I can see the talent and obviously he has it and we got him to worlds and Kona and so it's just been really really fun because I've never had an athlete of his caliber before so I want him to do well <laughs> so, yeah plus, plus he's your husband so that's that's always yeah. like a, an interesting dynamic it's as well true. <laughs> it's true all good things like, how good much things. can I get him to hurt <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, I'm like, but, keep but, going, but, keep going. But I do have to say, he has not broken down yet. So there, there will be a day. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. get him there. Uh, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so just push him until he breaks. Maybe it'll be. Maybe it'll be the. Uh, maybe it'll be the Kona training that does it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm. I told him this morning. I'm like, we need to like. We need to dial this in now. Like, like now is now. I know. Well, so. well, you got to get him back on his tri bike, which he like literally only rides oh, three times that. before he races. So. <laughs> I said, okay, so you need he might need to ride his twice tri a week. <laughs> oh, good luck with that. But okay. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Let's go back to Leadville. Um, so we have two different types of athletes coming into this race, um, and. One of the things that we kept talking about with Leadville and that people were telling you, especially Angela, is it's not technical. It is just long. No, that's bullshit. Now, <laughs> yes, that is that was that's what I just said. It was technical. So so let's I just want to put that out there. So when we go through this race recap, um, if anybody tells you that Leadville's not technical, you know. Um, but it's I don't think, and you can talk about it, I think it's not technical in like a, a sea otter classic twisty turny way. Mm -hmm. It's in a different way. But um, let's just just talk me through the race, you guys. Tell me about the energy of it. Tell me like you went to the expo the day before. Like what is this? What is Leadville about? What did it tell us about that? Well, it was um I think the race was started to kind of save this little little mining town in in Colorado. Um, and it's, so it's kind of centered around this really cute little um, boom town in up in the mountains in Colorado. Elevation of the town is 10,152 feet, I think. I'm a, we drove by the sign a bunch of times. Um, <laughs> and so, so it's this cute little town. Uh, there's a little expo couple like just one little city block or ha not even a city block um bunch of tents it's nothing nothing the size of sea otter which is sea otters become yeah. it's kind of taken over the the uh expo industry where like every single bike and sport manufacturer is there this is considerably smaller than that um but it's it's fun energy it's the Leadville 100, like from a mountain biker's perspective, it's the most famous mountain bike race to the point where it's kind of created a little bit of a backlash in the mountain bike world where people kind of think it's a little too commercial, a little too, um, a little too easy. Um, I don't know about easy. But uh, Angela, you guys little, should see like Angela's little... face. She's like, what? <laughs> I am not a mountain biker. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> this is why we have two perspectives on here. <laughs> but so it it's gotten the reputation that it's not technical and um oh. and as a mountain biker, like I see both sides of that. It's like um it's not twist it's not twisty turny single track. It's you're not gonna run into trees on it, but um but on the other hand, like I used all of my bike handling skills yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. It was, you were just constantly picking lines and thinking about traction and um, it's, it's still a very hard race. Um, and it's, I think it's a fun, really fun course. I love being up on the high Alpine above tree line and uh, mm-hmm. breathing that thin air. Um, it's, yeah, you don't seem to have too is. much of a problem with altitude like other people um, and racing at altitude. Now, Angela, did you have to do for Lifetime any like pre-expo stuff, get together with the other female athletes, or was this kind of a quick like in and out? Yeah, no, um, the, the Lifetime Grand Prix people uh, have been really, really good. Like we, we don't have to do too much. Um, I actually mm-hmm. recommended that they do stuff with us because I, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, but for me, I tried to keep it pretty low because I was really nervous about the race. And so yeah. we flew in on Thursday afternoon and then drove up, uh, got registered, which was great. We got everything done. We got food. We got everything done. Um, I brought, as I was saying, my good friend Brian to kind of be my crew support because I didn't have calf, even though we were all kind of connected. Um, and on Friday, we all went up to a part of the race. It was St. Keeves. We- yeah, we started this top of St. Kevin's and Hangerman. did Hangerman. Hangerman. Yeah, so it was it was kind of the more technical uh, climbing and descending, minus column mm-hmm. line, <laughs> which I was like yeah. <laughs> blown out of my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on Friday, that was helpful to actually kind of just go like an hour ride to kind of just see what I was kind of going my like having myself get into. Um, so when I did the race on Saturday, um, I knew already and I felt more confident in that area. Um, and so that was helpful. And so I could see people coming. I know there's a lifetime camp, um, like a month prior that, that you can come mm-hmm. and do all parts of the race, which I would love to have done. Um, mm-hmm. I think that would have helped a ton. <laughs> um, cause usually <laughs> when I do triathlons, I don't necessarily check out the entire course, but it's not like, like, like this, um, uh, the race, it blew my mind. <laughs> Let me ask you this. We have talked about how usually before Ironman now, you're not super nervous because you know what you're doing. You trust your training. You see, show up to the start mm-hmm. line. And I'm always like, I get so nervous. So for these lifetime races, especially the mountain bike ones, you you are nervous. Like it's, it's a new thing for you. Actually, so yeah. Are you like, like, is that a weird feeling to like be like a little nervous for a big race? Or are you just like, you know, I just, it's just interesting to me that you now, like it, it's so new and you get a little worked up. Yeah. It's totally different because I'm not nervous in a, in a sense of, um, doing the race. It's more because it's totally new. So it's actually really exciting. Yeah. So when I was driving to the race yesterday, I was, t- I was telling Brian, I'm like, I'm not really nervous. I'm excited because I don't really know what to expect. And I, I love jumping into these events because I have no expectation of myself. I just want to finish, you know, um, and experience it. So with Ironman, I've done them for so many years. I know what to kind of expect of myself or what I, like I have these outcome goals that I want. And so there's almost a little bit more pressure on myself in an Ironman. I mean, like there's no pressure on this. It's just like, let's just get to the finish line. (laughs) Um, because I'm finding this whole year more of, um, first of all, seeing if I like this stuff, which I do, and just a huge challenge. So it's a very, very different mindset when, when I go in. Um, I do get nervous at the start line, obviously. But this race, I have to say, we had corrals and they separated the corrals, I guess. That was a lot different in years past. So I was in the first corral. Um, and I think there was probably, I don't know, maybe 100 to 300 riders that started off. And when I did Unbound, you know, you have all the riders go off together. So the, so the energy is just like insane, but this one was a little bit more, uh, relaxed. I could say, you know, everyone kind of, kind of just flew like 
like the start of the race, you're going downhill on pavement. So you're flying, but it was, but it wasn't so congested. So I felt way more comfortable. Um, you know, um, I put aero bars on my mountain bike, which was fantastic. So I <laughs> felt more comfortable in that sense when, when, when we were on the flats. And I think I was, I was like one of the only ones with aero bars, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you think? Um, but yeah, the energy is did different. you use them? It's, it, it's fun. I did. Yeah. Um, there's, there's like, there's two climbs that are on dirt and gravel and all that stuff. And then you get into some flats and some, uh, flatter trails. So I used them a lot. Um, I'm quite comfortable in my air bars. And then on the way back I did. And so whenever I could, um, I did, mm -hmm. I find I get more power in my legs just cause I'm used to that position. So, um, yeah, I yeah. I actually, I understand that. Um, so, all right. So first, um, let, okay. So let's get started with this race. So Angela, um, what bike were you riding? Like what, what were your, what was your setup? Um, I'm on a light speed frame. Um, my setup, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> XTR Shimano. Um, all my parts are Shimano. Um, I don't really know what else I, I it's know. A titanium hardtail, yeah, which go. means, <laughs> which means, uh, no rear suspension. Um, titanium frame with a hundred millimeter travel front fork um so suspension mm -hmm. fork nice. and i have a i have a a button that makes me have suspension and not suspension so um, i use that a lot lockout a lockout suspension yeah. lockout so yeah. every time it was more flat and not so technical and stuff i would lock it out so that um it wouldn't it wouldn't bounce so much my oh, technical cool. terms versus his are totally opposite <laughs> <laughs> bouncing and <laughs> <laughs> I have a button. <laughs> I have this thing. I have a button. That's all I know. <laughs> um, all right. So you started obviously with the other. Did you start with, did they start the men and women Grand Prix together or was it men first and then yeah. women? Yeah. So the corrals were based on if you qualified with a certain time. And so the fast the times or certain qualifiers go in the first corral. And what they did is they did the corrals every two and a half minutes. So Seamus, you did were 10 and a half minutes behind or 12 and a half? 12 and a half 12 and a half because I didn't um, have a qualifying time yeah and plus he was part of a foundation and so um they started us all together and it was kind of nice because everyone in the first crowd are really good mountain bikers and fast so they all went out in front of me and so I had a really good mm -hmm. gap and so I didn't get stuck on any any climbs where people were walking and stuff and Mm -hmm. It wasn't bunched up. And so Seamus actually caught me after the two climbs at like mile 35 and it was more on the flats. And I was warned prior to this race because people that I've talked to started in the crowds behind me that you might get caught up with a bunch of people walking up those two climbs. And I didn't because I had an open field. So that, that was really nice for me because that, that included some of a descent that was pretty technical and, um, I liked not having the pressure of people behind me. Uh, yeah, and, me too. and, uh, yeah. And so before I met Seamus at mile 34 there, we went on pipeline and it's not technical, but I got in a group of about 10 to 15 men and a little bit higher than my caliber of experience, but I was going with them and it was going really well. And we went around the sharp turn and corner. And then there was these waterways with a bunch of divots and I, I, I hit the divot and I knew I was crashing. <gasps> And I've, cr and I've crashed before now that on my mountain bike. So I just like caught up myself into a ball and, um, fell, hit my head and my, and my whole side, but I was fine. I was like, okay, that was cool. And so then I was like, Angela, like, don't, don't be stupid. <laughs> don't, don't jump into things. So then I kind of like slow down a little bit and try to gain myself back. And, and then, yeah. So, so is pipeline, was it, um, was it just like wide dirt and then with the washouts and you just kind of caught and is that what pipeline, like, I know they have names for these like parts of the course. So is, was the pipeline just kind of like, or don't it was power line. It was power line. Power line. Power line. Oh, I'm power sorry. Line. Sorry. I get confused. Power line is just following power lines, basically dirt, mm -hmm. wider road. Okay, no, um, but they had a lot of washouts. Like there was yeah. a lot of rain washouts. Dirt deep road yeah. with when, when the rainstorm comes, it like, carves a groove yes through the through the dirt road so it can be i think they've been deeper in past years but it was like it would be like a foot deep like foot wide little trench like right in that's the what middle of the thing and you i went to right like, into it and sometimes it would go kind of diagonally across the <laughs> the 
road. So like, <laughs> it's a little, little hairy. Yeah. And then if you're following like a bunch of riders, you don't get to see it until it hits you right there. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So. But otherwise, and nobody was behind you. I would have been like no. freaking scared that somebody was going to run me over. Um, yeah. You crashed and then you have to come back from that mentally. I mean, you said you were like, all right, just slow down a little bit. Um, but did that, I know you crashed in Sea Otter a while ago. So that must have just been a little bit shaken because you don't want to crash. Uh, did you pull it together? Well, <laughs> well, I definitely pulled it together. Um, I wasn't shaken up. Like I knew when like in Sea Otter, I hit a branch with my, my, with, with, with my um, bike and I didn't even know what was happening and I just crashed and I actually crashed a few times in Sea Otter. Um, but this one, I knew it was happening. So I was well prepared. And then when I got off, I mean, I was sore, but like, I don't know. I, I wasn't sh yeah. shaken by it. I just knew that like, Angela, you just got to be a little smarter here. So tell us a little bit more. And I want to know what happened when you got to Columbine. Cause I want to uh, tell us about yeah. Columbine. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so, so after the crash, there was a little bit of single track kind of going down a side of a mountain kind of a little bit, but not like technical signal, single track. It was actually really, really nice. Um, and there was a guy behind me and I was going pretty slow at that point. Cause I was just after my crash. He's like, he's like, is, if there's a way I can, I can pass you, can pass you. I'm like, well, I don't know where, because like there was just no other trail and I didn't want to stop, <laughs> so, but he, but he managed to pass me. And then, then we got onto, um, some roads, some dirt roads and some pavement. And that's when Seamus came up behind me. Um, and that was kind of fun. And so we tried to do a pace line with one other guy, um, which we did for maybe like a couple minutes and then a hill came and then Seamus just went, <laughs> which was, which was great. I mean, that's what, that's what he was supposed to do. Um, but I couldn't keep up. And then, then the first aid station where our SAG and crew were. Um, so I was lucky enough to kind of jump in with, um, the athletes foundation. Um, that's where Brian was there and, he helped Seamus in that. And so I got in and Seamus was already there. He left. And then you start your climb up to Columbine. And the first part of Columbine is pretty good because you're on, you're on pay, you're on like a slow, steady dirt road kind of going up and it gets progressive. And, but then you get to a point where, um, like you're climbing up and it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And then you're seeing these fast guys descending, like the, like the first top 10, and they're flying down this hill. And so then that gets to me. I'm like, wow, these guys are like going insane. We have to, we, we have to descend down while people are climbing up. And then I don't know. Oh, oh, I didn't. Hill. Okay. Now I'm getting that. Okay. I got that. Yeah. And then there's right. like three or four miles. It's literally, I don't know. What, what's the percent grade? It's, uh, it was freaking nuts. It, like, it, it feels like it's like up. a climb. It's like uphill. It, no, I mean, it's like straight up and it's like rocks like like boulders <laughs> my 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 explanation of this is gonna be way different than Seamus says but this is what, what goes on in my head <laughs> so you start getting up and then you can see you can see all these riders and you and if you keep looking up the mountain you see little ants of riders and that I was like oh my gosh we have to we have to climb all this so you get to these points and it gets super steep and I would have to get off my bike and I'm walking and I never really walked in my mountain bike shoes before. And so I felt as I was walking, my calves were just going to like <laughs> blow up because it was so painful in terms of like the angle that you're walking on and pushing your bike. And then you would try to get on and then, um, you know, I rode some and then I would get off and I'd ride some. And then as, as you're doing this, you have like two miles or whatever. And it just seems like it's never ending. Like, I don't know how many hours... <laughs> took me to get to the top but we get to the top <laughs> and then and then and then you have these these people descending right beside you and it's it's just rocks and crevices everywhere and I there was a point that I, I looked up and I saw all these riders and I'm like oh my gosh I still have like all this distance to to get up and then you have these riders bombing down beside you and it looks really technical and I'm like how the hell am I going to do this and I almost just like freaked yeah. out and I just had to like mentally talk to myself I'm like I can do this, you know, like just one step at a time. But, and then you're wheezy because you can't breathe because you're up at like 13,000 feet. <laughs> um, but I managed to get to the top and then at the top, there's this like little roundabout thing and there's an aid station there. So I took two or three gels because I know on the descent that I wouldn't be able to eat and I didn't want to bonk or have that feeling because um, I wanted to be fully alert. So I just, I grabbed three gels, downed them before I started descending 
and the descent was actually really, really fun. Um, I, I felt great. It was actually a little chilly for me, but then you get warm because it got up to 70 yeah. degrees when you got to the bottom. But, um, yeah, it wasn't as bad as my, my, my mind was saying it was. So, but if I would have known, I think like in retrospect, I wish I would have looked a little bit more in detail about the race and maybe have gone to the camp if I could have, or somehow got out here and just kind of seen the entire course. Uh, I think that would have helped a ton. Um, just because I had that experience the day before the race and, and just knowing that little bit was, was super helpful for me. But, okay. That's good. So let's pause at Columbine and Seamus, <clears throat> you had, you were with the challenge athletes foundation. So you started a little bit back, um, and you got started and then you saw Angela up ahead. So tell us a little bit about the beginning of your race experience and your Columbine experience. <laughs> Yeah, so I started back in like the second to last wave. I got off with a good little group. There's two and a half minutes between each wave. So even though there were 600 people ahead of us, maybe there, um, when we actually started, we had clear roads for a while. Um, and I got in with this good little group and we were just cranking until we caught up to the wave ahead of us. And so then, whereas Angela on that first the first climb, Keevans mm -hmm. is it, um, and then there's a smaller one before that. It was pretty trafficy right off the bat for me, um, right on the first climb, and coming down. So then we did went up to the top of power line, did the power line descent, wasn't able to descend as fast as at like maximum speed because of traffic, but it wasn't too bad. Um, and then you're flat and fast on mm -hmm. roads for a while. And mm -hmm. that's um, eventually where I uh, met up with Angela quite a ways, like toward the end of that flat yeah. fast section is, yeah. where, is when we got together. I didn't have aero bars. So I spent a lot of time with my hands on the fork crown. So yeah, um, uh, like below the handlebars. Um, it's there's, completely like, nuts. Yeah, <laughs> you basically just there's like room for like two of your fingers to wrap around, and the rest of your hand is the rest of your hand is off the side of it. I want to ask, um, can you just tell everybody what bike you were riding, um, so we know your setup? Yeah, so I was on um, my cross country race bike, um, which I've been racing all season and riding a lot all season. It's a full suspension bike with a dropper seat post which means you can press a button and <laughs> uh, and the seat will go down which allows you more movement over the bike um, and allows you to get further back over the rear wheel you use it really just for descending um, but it allows as you get your weight further back on descent so it's you're more controlled on steep descents and also allows the bike to come up um, toward your belly more. So if, if uh, you go, you're going over a big rock or a fast roller, you can kind of keep your body in place and bring the bike up into your body. Um, it's kind of considered a little bit more bike than you need for Leadville. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot to be said for just riding the bike you're used to. Um, and I, I didn't think it was, I think it was perfect. Um, partially because I've got a lot of time on it and I, I really like the way it handles and everything, but um, I didn't mind having the suspension at all. The rear, the rear suspension. All right. What, what, all what right so, so back to Columbine. <laughs> back so you're so on the flats um, with me. So yeah. So I worked my way through a lot of traffic by the time I met up with Angela um, and we rode together for a little bit. The pace lines on the way out were kind of, were not really organized. Um, mm -hmm kind of hard to get people to get into a get into a good groove on a pace line people were like not knowing which side to pull off a, around on and mm -hmm. you know some people were taking five minute poles some people were taking five second poles and it was it was kind of um, haphazard um so we had a good little groove going for for a few minutes um got through the aid station got onto columbine um, there was a, there was a goo tent right at the corner, right. As you started mm -hmm. climbing, there was a goo neutral aid station where they're handing up goos. And I yelled to them. Um, I asked them who the leaders were and 
just for purely fanboy reasons, not, not that <laughs> because that was any contention for leaders, but just, just cur- curious which mountain bike heroes are up in the front. And, um, and they said there was a group of seven riding in a pack. Um, and so I was kind of expecting a group of seven to be, you know, coming down at us at any time. And so Columbine is 3,000 foot ascent with really no break in it at all, um, which is insane. It's insane. <laughs> and there's nothing like that to prepare us on the East Coast. Um, I think like the longest continuous climb you can get in Vermont is like maybe 800 feet or something like that. Like there's not, it's really hard to find a thousand feet of of vertical on the East coast. And this is 3000 feet without interruption. And the first, I'd say either half to two thirds is a pretty nicely graded, fairly wide gravel road where you could, you could drive a regular family sedan up it without scraping on anything and and two cars could negotiate passing each other without too much difficulty they had to slow down and, and negotiate it but but um uh they could it's two cars wide and then the top either half or third turns into turns into something that you couldn't <laughs> do like, anything with. yeah I, I mean like a, a four-wheel drive truck would have probably couldn't make it up you'd you'd need like either a um like a four-wheeler or um, a motorcycle or something like that like it's it's gnarly um it's really steep it's really loose it's really narrow you know it's maybe eight feet wide but there's just two ruts that are like a foot wide each and so (laughs) You've got the pros descending at like Mach 5 down one <laughs> rut and then all of us trying to climb on the other rut. And it's it's basically like a conga line up this rut. And so I'd say 80% of the people at that point are walking. And It's very, very steep. I actually rode the entire 105 mile. They didn't. I, didn't, uh, I just have to say, I have no idea how that's even possible. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's honestly <laughs> amazing to me. Like, and even the people that I were with, that I was with, like, we were all walking at points. There was maybe a few riders, but at one point, almost everyone that I, that I saw got off. So I have no idea how he did this. <laughs> well, I'm married to him. <laughs> So it's so it's his combination of stubbornness and the one thing I know about Seamus is that he has one of the highest abilities to suffer that I have ever seen. He will push himself and keep going no matter what. So I do understand, but um, but yet it is still quite impressive because so, I can Im- I can picture this whole scenario and also very glad I was not on. I would be walking the whole 3,000 <laughs> thing. So I, I would just be like, I'm done. I would walk the whole thing. I wouldn't even try. And I would be like, everybody have a good day. I'm good. <laughs> but anyway, so you climbed the whole thing. How was your breathing? <laughs> breathing, was, breathing was good. I got, you get into like this good rhythm. You, uh, the alpine breathing, like the high elevation breathing, you really focus on your exhales. So really try to get the CO2 out of your lungs and then and then you inhale naturally. Um, so it's all about like a, a like a like a good, strong, forceful exhale um, and staying on rhythm with it. Uh, it's like it was it was fine. It's fine until like you have to take a sip of water or or uh, eat a gel. And then just that like brief pause in that oh, yeah. breathing it just like, <laughs> creates this like cascade of like gasping like a like, like a fish out of water. Um, you actually would have really liked the first fifteen hundred feet of climbing on the on yeah. The, you would have actually liked that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's it was a tricky climb, um, but it was also. I mean, you're, it's, your eyes are just constantly looking for the, 
the pros coming down uh, at you looking for a spot to a, a spot to pass people looking at rocks for traction. So your eyes are constantly moving around, but I did take some opportunities to like look up at the scenery because you're up in this gorgeous bowl. Um, and you can just see for miles and miles, you're above the tree line. Um, and it's just a spectacular spot. Um, so it was, it was, I think Columbine was both the best and the worst <laughs> of the day. Um, I agree. It was... <laughs> so you bomb down Columbine. Um, and what mile is Columbine? Is that like the halfway point? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly the okay. halfway point. Yeah. The, top... a, the whole race is an out and back. Yeah. And um, so, so you turn around oh, okay. the Columbine and come back. Yeah. It's 104 and well, almost 105 miles. So the top's like 52 something. Yeah, and um, I was trying to track you guys. Angela, you lost your tracker, so yeah. I got very worried that you had to like pull out. But then I texted, you know, I texted Brian, and he said you were still going. That you lost your plate, um, so I was a little. Felt it was a little probably about when that. I crashed. Actually, now that I think about yeah. it, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't even know. I and really then, didn't have it. So, so tell us a little bit about the end of the race because this is getting a little long. I just want to make sure we get to the end of the race and then um, what it felt like um, and how the end went. Yeah, so I descended Columbine. Uh, it was a really fun descent, actually. And then you you ride a little bit um, and then you're back at the main eight station crew, support crew, and you have 40 miles left. Um, so at that point, I stuffed my, my face. Um, so I saw... Brian, he's like, how you doing? And like, at that point, I'm like, I was just like blown. <laughs> like my mind was blown. And I was like, <laughs> change my, my, my hydration pack. And I, and he's like, what do you need? And I, I said a Snickers. And so he like opened a Snickers and just like stuffed it in my mouth. <laughs> and I just like had this like <laughs> bolus of food in my mouth that I had to chew down. Um, and then just started riding again. The last 40 miles, the rain clouds were kind of coming in. So I was a little nervous that we were going to get stuck in the rain, but it wasn't too bad. The climb up pipeline was grueling I thought it was like like you descend down on the way out and you don't think it's that big of a deal but I was it was it was brutal <laughs> and so the climb was rough I walked a little bit of that um and at that point I was getting kind of tired and then we had to go back through the climb on Hangerman and I I found that mentally the most draining and it was probably because I was hitting a tired point and there's just a lot of, of like rocks and, and like, it's not that hard, but it just mentally almost broke me because it was just, it just took a lot of energy. And so we got to this point where you, where you finish from all the rocks and, and, and terrain and you turn and you get on a dirt road and there was a guy there and I was like, oh my gosh, that was so freaking brutal. I just started laughing because I was just like over it. Um, <laughs> And then you're on pavement and then you have to climb, you have to do this, the climb back on pavement. What, what's that one called? It's like the last climb, uh, St. Kevin's. So it's all pavement. And so it was good, but it was long. Like, like basically the climbs on the way back were really, really long. <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> you know, you get into town or very close to town. And I thought it was just going to be all pavement all the way into town. And then you get back on the stupid like trail again and I'm like what is this <laughs> for like a mile and a half and I was like oh there's still more and so I so I had like there was a point I was at seven and a half hours and I was like oh I could maybe get under nine hours and so I was really really trying and on my um Garmin uh it auto paused a few times and so I didn't really know exactly the time uh, but I crossed the line with my Garmin at like 901. I was trying so hard, but I just had nothing left in the tank the last like couple of miles. Yeah. And, um, but I, I finished in 907. So it was, it, it was good. It was, amazing. it was fun. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a day for me. It was a day. <laughs> it was a day. <laughs> and Seamus, the end of the race for you, you said you felt strong the whole way, um, back um which is awesome um and you probably loved the climbs on the way back <laughs> yeah there's definitely a point of it where i was like okay I, this is this is enough climbing <laughs> i've had my full <laughs> fill but there was still more climbing to do um yeah i had a good climb up um power line 
Uh, that was really technical. Again, steep and rocky and loose and um, a lot of people walking. And I made that whole climb, uh, which takes a lot out of you. And then you've got to do the, the paved climb, which wasn't, wasn't technically hard or anything, but it's tricky. You kind of want to just like throw the anchor out and, and soft pedal up it, but you also want to get done. So um, it was, I, I had, there was a couple of people that I was with that were riding at a good pace and we weren't like pace lining up it, but it was just good motivation to like, if one of them gets ahead, then like, yeah. oh yeah, I need to, I need to hit, hit the gas again. Um, and then it just like, <laughs> it's the last the last 15 miles are just long mm -hmm. it's it's like you're getting closer and closer and it's you know you've done 90 miles so you're like you're like what's 15 more <laughs> 15 more is a lot <laughs> still. Uh, and uh so that was tough i was trying to break eight hours and so i was i was hitting it pretty hard toward the end, um, ended up finishing eight hours and two tenths of a second or something like that. I like, know. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> like saw that. Even, I was like, oh my gosh. It wasn't even gosh. eight hours and one second. It was like eight hours and a, yeah. and like a little fragment of a second. Um, so I'm going to like, I'm going to try to call up Lifetime and ask him to <laughs> make it 7.59.59 or something like that. So yeah, so um, you finished in an incredible um eight hours which is amazing um and you both got belt buckles right i think the thing with leadville is like you get belt buckles like if you finish in a certain time right yeah if you finish under nine you get this big belt big one and then if you go from nine to 12 hours you get a smaller one so i got small which will probably fit you better it will fit me better you know <laughs> we're gonna get some cowboy boots today and <laughs> go two step yes <laughs> we were talking about last night I want yep, yeah, let's let's get a video. We'll put it out there. Um congratulations to you both uh for finishing this super hard race. Um and Angela ticking off another lifetime Grand Prix series um race, which is amazing. Um so to wrap this up, what is one piece of advice you would give somebody who's about to do Leadville? Oh, um, Sam, you go first. You got anything? No, I think you should go first. I'm trying to think. Um, well, I guess it's not really about, well, I guess I would want to just, uh, showcase what I learned. And we were talking about this last night over some drinks. Um, when I would mountain bike prior to this race, I would kind of only look five feet ahead of me and my mm -hmm. wheel, which you don't want to always look at your wheel, obviously. But I learned over the course of the entire race to really look almost 10 to 15 feet ahead of me and not worry about where you, the bike is. And the, it was a game changer. Like I was able to actually ride anything at that point. And um, so I guess that is one skill that I think you would want to learn um, or at least experience. But in terms of Leadville itself, um, if you can come here prior, I, I, you know, in retrospect, I think it would have helped me as someone who's never mountain bikes and stuff to kind of learn and experience it a bit more and kind of know what I'm getting myself into. Um, but otherwise just have fun. I mean, it's, it, it's an experience. It's a day. Like it's, it's I a day it anymore. Than that. <laughs> it's just a day. <laughs> it's not really that much good advice on my end. <laughs> no, that was good. So advice. she will come up with something now. <laughs> I, I think, the race is just all about the aerobic engine. It's just, it's just a yeah. big day and, um, and you have to dig deep and so many times and then recover and then keep on going and even still go pretty hard while you're recovering. Um, so it's, it's all about that aerobic engine. Um, skills wise, I think probably the best advice is find any ski mountain you can get to yeah. in the, in the off season. And just about any ski resort is going to have some dirt road that goes to the top, like a, like a service road that goes to the top of the mountain and try to ride up that ride up and down that service road. Um, because a lot of, a lot of the trail is basically like that. It's a, it's like a, 
um, medium well maintained dirt road that goes straight, straight, straight up the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even if you're not going to be able to get 3,000 feet of vertical, but something. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Well, awesome. Um, well, thank you guys. It is early in the morning there, um, and we will get this out tonight. Um, and I am super excited uh, to see you guys back here on the Cape um, and hear more about it. We're going to take a screenshot. You took a screenshot? Okay. No, I'm um, going to. I'm going okay. to. Smile. Smile. <laughs> Okay, I totally forgot we were this. podcasting. I'm like, oh, let's just do this. <laughs> we are podcasting. We are pro. All right. <laughs> this is pro. Listen, everybody out there, give us an email at iracelikeagirl at gmail.com. Um, send us mail. Ask us questions. Um, and uh, put your name in the lottery for next year for Leadville because yeah. it's, a, it's a day. <laughs> It's a day. That's, that's what we're going to call the podcast. It was a day. It's a thing. It was it's a, a day. <laughs> it's a thing. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.